There's an awful lot to say about housing at the moment, uh, an awful lot being said, an awful lot of controversy and argument, but um, increasingly uh, a consensus, I think, that um, the housing crisis, the housing shortage in London is perhaps the most difficult and apparently intractable problem that London faces. Um, that's the view of uh, the current mayor, the gravest challenge that we face. It's increasingly apparent in the polling that the GLA does that the cost of housing, access to housing, is now uh, often seen as the biggest issue. It's increasingly one that's of concern to employers. And um, as I say here, it's um, historically perhaps been a cyclical issue, but it's also structural. It's a long-term issue, as we will see. So beh behind me, you can see quite a complicated graphic which sets out a number of quite simple things. The first is a blue line which shows that in the years up until the Second World War, um, plus or minus, London's population was rising. Um, it fell very rapidly after the Second World War and it's been picking up since the 1990s uh, and is rapidly heading towards 9 and possibly 10 million. You can then see um, the numbers that we've dug out looking at how many homes were built in London all the way back to the 1870s, to the mid-Victorian era. And you can perhaps make that out. Um, it's colour-coded from 1960 when um, affordable housing uh, was also um, a feature. But as you can see there, with one major exception, which was the 1930s, and one partial exception, which was the 1960s and 70s, we in London have not been building um, anywhere close to the red dotted line. Now, the red dotted line indicates the 42,000 homes a year, which the mayor has now decided should be London's new target. So that, I think, demonstrates the long term, as well as the cyclical nature of the problem we face. More and more people are coming to London, more and more people are living here, and we need to roughly double house building to reach those targets. So where are, those people coming, uh, where are those people coming from? Because one of the controversies, perhaps, in some quarters is that there are too many immigrants coming, all sorts of ways we might try and manage demand for housing. Again, apologies for what may appear to be a slightly uh, confusing graphic or a complicated one. The total population um, is the black line. What this shows you, though, is that in UK net migration, this is people coming to London, which is the sort of red below the line. Um, as you can see, perhaps unsurprisingly, since the crash in 2008, very depleted. Not that many people coming here from elsewhere in the UK. You can also see at the top in the green, I think quite interesting, if you track back to the early years of this century, um, actually net uh, international migration was greater than it is today. So the real issue is not foreigners coming to London. It is natural change. It's the blue graphic. It is the fact that Londoners are fertile, they are young, and they breed. And that isn't going anywhere. Um, so the indigenous population growth is really what's driving these numbers. It's not something we can control through demand management. The other thing to say, of course, is that people do still want to come here, and those that are here want to stay here because it's a great place to be, as we saw from some of those um, video clips a moment or two ago. And in fact, one of the fantastic successes of London is this extraordinary jobs growth. Um, London, as you can see here on the blue line, actually suffered worse than the rest of the country at the beginning of the recession, but recovered extremely quickly. And 11.5% um, of the nation's job growth in the three years to the end of 2013 were in London, um, compared to just 2.2% elsewhere. And 80%, something like 80% of the net new jobs growth in the UK um, has uh, or in the private sector, I should say, in the UK, has been from London. So you can see there how, at a rate which is now about a quarter of a million new jobs a year, London is really powering ahead of the rest of the um, English economy. That carries its own difficulties, and there were some comments made in those video clips around that, but this is a fact of life, and it's unlikely to change any time soon, even if we wanted it to. And perhaps unsurprisingly, those factors that I've described on the demand side, the supply side, are seeing a situation where house prices in London are now detaching, really, from the, um, uh, from the uh, trends in the rest of the southeast of England. 
pretty much for the first time in modern times. This graphic goes back to 1973. And you can see the dark blue London line there tracking pretty accurately what's happening in the outer metropolitan southeast and the rest of the southeast until um, really the time of the recession when uh, London house prices recovered relatively quickly and are increasingly detaching themselves. A symptom really of some of those demand pressures and the shortage of supply. And that all means that we're seeing some very interesting and very important structural changes in how people live and the tenures that they occupy. Um, we've seen over a number of years now, dating back more than a decade, owner occupation falling away, not just in terms of um, a relative proportion of uh, households, but in absolute numbers. We've seen social housing falling away as right to buy has eaten away and eroded at uh, that. And we've seen this enormous rise in private renting, market renting, which comes obviously with some uh, real disadvantages for many people because it is not secure uh, and it is also um, increasingly expensive. But we now have more private renters than we do social renters. And if you look at where the trends are taking us, uh, many are now predicting that we may well see um, so, uh, private renting possibly overtaking owner occupation in the next 30 years. So these are deep structural trends and problems that we have to deal with, with very important impacts. The social impacts of the housing crisis are perhaps quite obvious, but very importantly, big, big economic costs. Michael Ball, the Professor Michael Ball at Reading University has done some very interesting detailed work looking at the projected shortfall of housing for professionals, early mid-career professionals over the next 10 years. And his calculations suggest that anywhere between 15 and 35 billion of uh, loss of economic output um, could be the outcome from not having enough suitable and affordable housing. And it's also important to bear in mind as well that every home we build creates at least two jobs. And if we look at those numbers, that I showed you a few minutes ago, the 42,000 homes a year that the mayor is looking to see built in London. If you translate that into pounds, shillings and pence, that's the equivalent of something in the order of 10 billion pounds of economic activity every single year. So what about this new target that the mayor set? Well, one of the other very important things about housing in London, particularly new housing in London and getting it cranked up to these new numbers, is of course it's very difficult to find sufficient land that's easily developable in a very constrained city um, with a very active Greenbelt policy. What this chart here shows is where um, the work that the, the GLA has done looking at the availability of land lies over the next 10 years or so. Unsurprisingly, with an interesting exception of Barnet in the northwest, the vast bulk of the really big development opportunities lie in the east of London. The London borough of Tower Hamlets alone, about 3% of London's population, has got the development land for more than 10% of new supply. So we know that London has to continue to go east, and we also know that going east comes at a price. Michelle will be talking about transport infrastructure. We know there's a price in terms of um, other local infrastructure, utilities, brownfield remediation and other things. And all of these issues are encapsulated in the Mayor's new housing strategy, which talks about the new target. For the first time in a long time, it talks about housing being seen as a critical part of London's infrastructure. Getting towards these numbers is every bit as important as building uh, Crossrail, getting the money for Crossrail to, getting the utilities sorted out. Housing is now seen and increasingly needs to be acknowledged as strategic infrastructure. The Mayor is also picking up this point about doing more to help low-income and indeed middle-income Londoners find access to better quality housing. Whether a covenant, as he calls it, to do more to help reward hard-working Londoners find suitable housing solutions. And very importantly, um, the need for long-term investment and not short-term stop-start programs. The good news is, though, that there is subsidy for, certainly for affordable housing in London, 
uh, one and a quarter billion pounds over the three years from 2015. But this is not anywhere near sufficient to deliver the sorts of numbers we're talking about. And that's why we need to find more leverage, frankly, from the housing association sector, who are increasingly cross-subsidizing development through their own build for sale programs and their own um, borrowings. It's also why we need to make sure that the planning system continues to work as efficiently as it can to deliver Section 106 contributions. And we also need to do more to use these new and quite interesting recoverable long-term investments that government can make available through programs like Build to Rent, Housing Zones, um, Get Britain Building, long-term guarantees or recoverable investments which can sit off the borrowing balance sheet for government um, do need to be recoverable but can help to get development moving. We know too that housing revenue accounts at local authority level can give us a bit more flexibility to get council housing built but that comes with the constraint of borrowing caps. So the point I'm making here is that all or virtually all public funding for housing with the sole exception of the small amount that local councils can raise comes from central government. And that's one of the things that the mayor is very keen to see switched, if at all possible. Because it seems anomalous that in the United Kingdom, as you can see here, um, the amount that local and provincial government raises as a proportion of GDP is well under 2%. And that compares, as you can see, very graphically to other perhaps comparable countries. And it doesn't seem right that we haven't got more autonomy to do things like invest the proceeds from property taxes in London to support some of the long-term interventions that we're going to need to make these new numbers any sort of reality. So, to encapsulate what the Mayor's looking to do in his strategy, first of all, money. We need a longer-term funding settlement that takes away the stop start uncertainties of public sector um, spending rounds and gives the ability for London to fund and finance its own future infrastructure needs, including housing. An easy ask and a difficult win, but one that I'm sure will play out in the months and years to come. Secondly, the Mayor's a major landowner, um, and we are doing a lot to bring that land forward, not just to develop homes, but to look for new innovative solutions to getting housing built, including housing zones, which I'll say something about in a second, and including getting new developers, new forms of funding, particularly equity finance, into the housing sector. So putting that together, we're also working to get things moving quicker, to build capacity in the development sector with local authorities, to focus particularly on these major um, opportunities in East London and elsewhere where we've got opportunity areas, and including the use of things like mayoral development corporations, where we'll soon have one in Old Oak Common. Uh, because this is very topical, launched by the Mayor and the Chancellor week last Friday, um, this new housing zones programme, £400 million, £200 million from the Mayor, matched by the Chancellor, to get something like 20 new housing zones operating across London. What are housing zones? Well, it's places like Meridian Water in Enfield, big former industrial and gas works site, places like Tottenham Hale in Haringey, where you've got fantastic transport infrastructure, great development opportunities around about, but for all sorts of reasons, things haven't happened as quickly as they should do. Other places too where we know there is the potential for really major home building and new communities to emerge. So what we're saying is, let's have a something for something deal with the boroughs concerned. I know Rob Leake's in the audience, and Rob's been doing a lot of work with us on Meridian Water in Enfield. Um, let's think about how we can use our joint planning powers. Let's think about how we can use some of this finance to bring land forward, to get land remediated, to put in infrastructure, to get the kind of support we need to build confidence to bring investment to these places. And let's maybe explore some of the other mechanisms which we know the Chancellor and Government are keen to look at, like local development orders and other ways to streamline planning. So I think this is one to watch. 20 zones, 50,000 homes, 10-year period and very flexible funding. Um, so I think a major initiative which hopefully will prove the value of regeneration um, in terms of helping to get some of these new homes built for London. Thank you very much.